Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruid and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. So today's speaker is Sam Beer. Sam is a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Virginia. He works on issues related to language documentation and description. His own fieldwork has been with Kuliak languages of northeastern Uganda. In his current project, he is creating a digital archive of the field notes and audio recordings collected by a British history graduate student. And he's using these materials as a lens for which to explore how different disciplinary attitudes towards oral data and archiving shape the archival records. Please join me in welcoming Sam as he gives his talk, Disciplining the Archive, African History, John M. Weatherby, So Data and Language Archives. Then the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you. It's a particular pleasure to present this research to the Rift Valley Network, um, because I know that many of you have been active in working to make legacy materials accessible and in using them to inform your linguistic analyses. Uh, and also especially because Bonnie Sands actually played a really crucial role in making this project possible. Um, she actually is the person who got me out of a dead end when I was first trying to find the materials that I discuss a bit in this paper. Um, so this is Lokiru Kosma. And the first time I met Lokiru Kosma, he asked me if I knew John Weatherby. I had just finished my second year as an undergraduate linguistics student and a serendipitous chain of relationships had provided me with the opportunity to conduct linguistic fieldwork in Lokiru's language, so. I was really taken aback by Lokiru's question. I was bemused by the idea that I might happen to know some particular man that Lokiru had met some undisclosed number of years before. So at the time, I shrugged the question off and I proceeded with my own work. The interaction didn't strike me as significant, but in a delightful turn of events, a huge part of my research time in the past several years has ended up being spent getting to know John Weatherby and reflecting on why I didn't know John Weatherby in the first place. Lokiru's question is stuck in my mind as through the project that I'll be discussing today, in the past few years, I found myself increasingly in the position of a user of archival materials in addition to being a creator or collector or depositor of archival materials. I got into this position of working with archival stuff um, by trying to find archival sources for Nyang Yi, a language related to So, um, which I wrote a grammatical description of the last idiolect that I can find of Nyang Yi for my doctoral dissertation. Despite a small body of word lists and such, I was never able to find the primary field notes um, on which the public, published data were based. Similarly, for a long time, I couldn't find any of the field notes or like people's journals from the six people who were cited as having collected on published notes about any of these languages. So getting to know John Weatherby was hardly straightforward, um, particularly as uh, he passed away over a decade ago. I faced obstacles in discovering his materials. Um, as I've mentioned, some of those obstacles were uh, obviated somewhat by Bonnie Sands. And I've encountered a suite of issues accessing the substance of Weatherby's materials once I did get a hold of them. Um, and I'm sure that those types of issues are going to be very familiar to anybody who's ever worked with anyone else's primary data. My naive assumption early in this process was that Weatherby's disciplinary context must not have assigned much value to the creation of accessible multifunctional archives that provide accountability for scholarly claims. However, I've been really struck by the extent to which Weatherby's work took place right in the midst of an academic movement calling explicitly for the collection and preservation of vast corpora of oral data and how disciplines that I might have expected to yield linguistically useful archival traces like really didn't from the area at the time. So I've wrestled with a series of questions since then, which I'll uh, talk about a little bit 
today. Uh, questions like, why was there suddenly, around the time that Weatherby was working in the late 60s and early 70s, a huge surge in oral data uh, recorded by specifically historians at that time? Or why wasn't the movement of historians collecting all of this data able to create the sort of accessible multifunctional archives that provide accountability for scholarly claims when they said pretty explicitly that that was their goal, was to create that sort of archive. Or I asked, why aren't other disciplines with textualist traditions creating, collecting, or using much oral data in East Africa at that time? And finally, what does the failure of the historian's project mean for the project in my discipline of language documentation? Uh, do we have any reason to believe that our own project of archive construction might be more successfully than that of history? So a helpful place to start might be with asking why I might expect to know John Weatherby or might have expected to have known John Weatherby, which will require a little bit of background. Weatherby was a doctoral student in history at Makerere University, Uganda's first university. His thesis, which was never accepted, was a study of the history and culture of the So. Uh, the So language together with Nyangi and Ik is part of the Kuliak language family, um, which since Greenberg's 1963 classification has pretty much been treated as a branch of Nilo-Saharan, although I think there's been a growing consensus towards caution with that classification. Um, Sands and Goldemann have both in recent-ish years um, questioned if we should really be classifying Kuliak within a, a phylum at all. And all of these Kuliak languages are spoken around the periphery of Karamoja region in northeastern Uganda. Weatherby's involvement with Makerere University uh, stretched from 1957 to 1974, and this was a time that's been labeled a golden age of history in Uganda by scholars um, from African history. During this time, and in anticipation of or response to the fallout of decolonization, historians were turning their attention to the pre-colonial history of Africa. The development of this new field was facilitated by a novel embrace of oral tradition as a source of historical evidence. The use of oral tradition and history resulted in extensive collection by historians of presumably verbatim original language records of speech in African languages, whether audio recorded or in transcript. So the easy answer for why I might have expected to know about John Weatherby is that I was doing work with Kuliak languages. And as part of this movement in history, he had assembled a relatively large collection of texts during his doctoral research. The development of the academic study of African history, particularly in the English speaking world, really grew out of unpromising soil. Uh, Hegel in 1831 had declared that the African past lacked movement or development, and therefore Africa was no historical part of the world. And by the mid 20th century, you still had analogs of that comment ranging from a really bombastic claim that always gets cited by Hugh Trevor Roper, Roper the Oxford Regis Professor of History, or relatively more banal criticisms of the prospect of African history, um, one of which uh, from Dame Marjorie Parham uh, is particularly relevant for this paper. She said, until the very recent penetration by Europe, the greater part of the continent of Africa was without writing, and so without history. So that's the starting point for the study of African history by especially Anglophone historians in the mid 20th century. That meant that these Anglophone Africanist historians really had to struggle uh, for the legitimacy of their domain of study to be recognized within the broader discipline of history. One way that they sought to demonstrate their legitimacy was by converting their oral data into 
archives that would be legible to the broader community of historians whose work depended upon written records from institutional archives on the regular. This required historians to reconceptualize the nature of historical research a little bit. One of the leading advocates for reimagining the archive in African history was Philip Curtin. Um, he was a historian who served as the chair of the African Studies Association's short-lived oral data committee in the late 1960s. And he pointed out that when a historian collects oral data from fieldwork, the historian's notes and tape recordings are no longer intermediate steps towards his own answer to a specific problem. They no longer refer back to the sources, rather they are the source, often a primary source that exists in his copy alone because evidently historians could only be men at the time. Since the normal rules of historical verification require the historian to cite the most original version of his sources, these same professional standards now require historians to preserve sources in their most original form and to place these on public deposit. Surface similarities between the work of mid 20th century Africanist historians and turn of millennium documentary linguists as described, for example, in Himmelman's papers or Woodbury 2011 abound. Linguists will recognize the historian's assertion that one key function of the archive is as a means for verifying a scholar's claims from recent work in their own discipline on citation practices and reproducibility. Similarly, the Africanist historians insisted, like Himmelmann 98, that compiling primary source material and analyzing it were distinctive activities that should be theorized and evaluated separately from each other. Africanist historians recognized the potential of their oral data archives to testify about issues that researchers were not focused on at the time of the data's initial collection. Uh, so a leading scholar in the collection of oral traditions in Africa was Jan von Sina, and he would later celebrate the evidence that historians field notes unwittingly and accidentally preserve, uh, which contain a great deal of information elicited from colonial subjects rather than rulers. The production of archives that could benefit scholars from other disciplines is likewise a motivating idea for contemporary documentary linguists. Um, and finally, in both disciplines, scholars marshaled the rhetoric of scientific rigor in a struggle to prove the legitimacy of text collection and present <clears throat> in a struggle to pursue, pres prove the legitimacy of text collection and preservation to the rest of their respective fields. So we have a lot of surface level similarities. Um, those ones. But these similarities belie deeper differences between the disciplinary context in which the Africanist historians of the 1960s and the documentary linguists of recent decades sought to implement their textual product projects. These different contexts shaped both the nature of the materials that participants in these projects collected and the reception that each research agenda found in its discipline with one consequence being that historians' uh, project did not result in widely used repositories of primary data. The language documentation's enterprise quest, enterprise's quest for legitimacy within linguistics has been bolstered by rhetorical strategies that uh, came out of the endangered language movement from which language documentation itself has largely emerged in its present form. One such argument asserts that the languages of the world are being lost in a mass extinction event that poses through the loss of data contained within these languages or within the minds of their speakers, an existential threat to the entire discipline. However, according to the argument, language documentation is an intervention that can preserve this data, which is the empirical base required to produce the theoretical work that garners prestige in the discipline. So in essence, what this argument says is that without documentary linguistics, the discipline of linguistics loses its object of study. Documentary linguistics is a, a legitimate part of linguistics because 
you depend on us. Without us, you've lost what you claim to do. And this type of claim rests on the idea that in principle, findings from each language in the world have the potential to make crucial contributions to the often incompatible projects that constitute the major divisions in the very fractious landscape of the discipline of linguistics. So this type of argumentation is relevant whether you're talking about modeling a universally shared language faculty, which underlies every language, or the project of documenting the breadth of linguistic diversity. The recurrent emphasis on the looming loss of some frightful proportion of the world's languages and scholarship on endangered languages and documentation then taps into linguist self-interest. The ability of the rest of linguistics to be rigorous depends on language documentation and description, and no language is expendable. It's really hard to make such a discipline-wide appeal in a more eclectic discipline like history. Um, there's no overarching disciplinary project that regional specialists are all contributing to in their own way, uh, in general, in the discipline of history. There's no way, therefore, for regional specialists to make the case that the rigor of the entire disciplinary superstructure is at risk if their work isn't given a place in the discipline. So in the Africanist historian's quest for legitimacy, you have the case that the new methods developed in the study of African history were rigorous enough to have a place in the discipline, not that the discipline was lost without the study of Africanist history. Where documentary linguists often made the claim that the whole discipline of linguistics depended on documentary linguists, Africanist historians depended on the discipline of history to a certain extent. So as a consequence, even when Africanist historians could recruit the rhetoric of salvage ethnography in the face of imminent not knowledge loss to make their case, which they often did, their appeals to the rest of their discipline lacked the immediacy and urgency achieved by documentary linguists at tapping into the self-interest of their disciplinary colleagues. The appeal for legitimacy had to be made a different way. And in the leading methodological texts of the era, the Africanist historian's strategy was to emphasize a fundamental similarity between the methods used in the study of oral traditions as history and the methods relying on written sources, which were used in the rest of the world. So for example, oral traditions that were claimed to have been conventionally transmitted word for word were given precedence over traditions in which what was transmitted was just the general idea. The distinction between these two ty types of traditions was a key issue in much Africanist historiography of the 1960s and the 1970s. A fundamental ideology underlying Africanist historians' quest for legitimacy was a notion that any manifestation of the stance of an individual consultant was a distortion to be corrected for or a contamination to be purified from the record. Um, so in an appendix on data collection methods in what was really the foundational text for doing history with oral traditions in Africa of Encina 1965, in an appendix of this, Vancina discusses how to overcome the hazards of consultants accommodating their performances to an audience. So of central importance, Vancina claims, is for the researcher to avoid really revealing any personal interest in the issues being analyzed um, or being discussed by all means possible. And Vancina took this to extremes, such as pretending not to speak languages in which one is in fact conversant. And the reason for this is Vancina's terrified that consultants will be tempted to take the immediate audience into consideration in the presentation of the tradition, and it will be less directly transmitting the purest form of the tradition. Um, Reflecting on a time when he had feigned linguistic incompetence, he recalls that since the consultant was under no impression that Vancina, quote, did not understand what he was saying, he felt that how he said it was unimportant and he had no particular motive for distorting the tradition. 
end quote. This overarching preoccupation with objective data um, undercut the visions that I mentioned earlier of oral history archives providing a durable record of the voices of colonial subjects or as a multi-purpose record that could be useful to scholars from other disciplines. The exact quality of historians' ideal texts that made them desirable to historians as sources of evidence about the past. So this quality is that the ideal texts were independent from the individual speaker who provided the text, rendered these texts less valuable as actual articulations of African voices. If you've methodologically filtered out any chance that individual Africans' voices are being heard, then the texts like are not be, gonna be as powerful at articulating African voices. Similarly, some methods, uh, such methods as pretending not to speak a consultant's language can hardly be expected to yield the sort of data representative of naturalistic communication that linguists can really use. Um, so for instance, when I am listening to a recording uh, from Weatherby's materials, I feel a longing for the evidence of prior negotiation for a less aspirationally objective record uh, in bits like this. Cool, cool, cool. I've got a cannot play media uh, warning. Um, so in this exchange, Weatherby says he's not a Tepez, and then he says in so, uh, Tepez is another name for so, Merea Kadmat, uh, which means presumably I'm not a, a So or somebody from Mount Kadam in this case. And his interlocutor, Loguti, who is on the cover slide, says Merea Al Kadmat or something along those lines. At which point Weatherby responds, uh, note that he says here this thing. He puts in this word just before the uh, tribal name, but in some cases he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that if he says, I am not a Turkana. Uh, mereat turkana, and the speaker says mereat turukea. The main point that I want to make with this bit of data is that what's being preserved in the recording isn't like an initial data elicitation session. This isn't whether be learning for the first time how to say these things and negotiating the meanings with his interlocutor. Instead, he has an objective of exactly what form he wants to record in order to have uh, an objective record for future purposes. And he offers this metalinguistic analysis of the gram grammatical phenomena under discussion. And that offers only just a little residue of those prior negotiations and maybe gives us a hint of what might have been underlying. Um, you know, hours of recordings where there isn't this sort of metalinguistic interjection. In exchanges such as these, Weatherby's goal is to collect an objective record of a native speaker producing a predetermined target language form accompanied by an English language gloss. Uh, just as Vancina 1965 earned historians to collect the most speaker-free textual data possible, um, Weatherby's elicitation practices seem aimed at removing evidence of the speaker's individual contribution as anything other than the reproduction of a stable standardized form. So the perceived precarity of the African historian's claim to legitimacy in the broader discipline of history restricted the production of oral data in ways that undermined the project of producing corpora of oral data that were varied and useful to scholars of other disciplines. In the same way, the lack of access to the types of institutional investment that documentary linguistics has benefited from, such as well-endowed dedicated archives, initiatives at the level of the discipline-wide professional society to recognize archive construction as a professional activity, left the efforts to preserve the data that was collected stunted. Further, despite the expectation of scholars such as Vancina that the full corpus of oral traditions collected by historians should ultimately be published. The corpora actually deposited in archives 
or published often represented only a subset of the recorded traditions referred to in the historian's work. In these instances, the archive couldn't actually serve as a way to reconstruct the collector's analyses from the original data, as not all of the data underlying the analyses is even available. Instead, the archive plays a more symbolic role, um, suggesting that the researcher has credibility, but not actually offering sufficient means to demonstrate that. Um, so one prominent monograph published by a scholar that Weatherby corresponded with states that excerpts from these tape recordings are being deposited with Indiana University. So it's just excerpts being deposited and also these excerpts don't actually exist in the Indiana University library catalog. Um, so they may not have ever been a situation that is familiar to linguists. Finally, a lot of the depositories established to house African oral traditions have failed to stand the test of time. Uh, one prominent example is the History of Africa Project, an initiative spearheaded by Weatherby's advisor, uh, Burton Webster, to which Weatherby contributed. In this pro project, transcripts of over 1,000 interviews were compiled for dozens of cultures across Uganda in 1969, with considerably more interviews from more areas of Uganda following in the two years later before the project was disbanded uh, following the rise of Idi Amin in the early 1970s. These transcripts were deposited at the Department of History at Makere University. Uh, however, Carol Zickerman reported that as of 2001, all field notes for the History of Uganda project have been lost. So a huge depository with countless documents and they seem gone. So by way of summary, leading Africanist historians envisioned a world resembling the world idealized in documentary linguistics. For the Africanist historians, this was a world in which primary data produced in the form of recorded oral traditions became accessible and lasting records of the actual voices of people that it was collected from. Uh, voices meaning the sound of the voice, but also the ideas and thoughts of the person. These records could be used to evaluate historians' claims. They could be optimized for multi-purpose use across disciplines. But despite looking on the surface like text collection and linguistics, the historian's project fundamentally differed um, in part because 1960s Africanist historians were constrained by their struggle for leg disciplinary legitimacy. As a result, the data collections that they pursued were often in conflict with their aspirations for transdisciplinary utility. They only deemed a highly circumscribed set of materials worthy of verbatim representation. They encouraged field workers to contrive collection sessions for the explicit purpose of obscuring individual consultants' voices. And the project of creating archives into which all researchers could deposit their materials was never broadly embraced by researchers on the ground, nor provided with institutional support. Few scholars actually deposited their materials into archives. Many archives with limited institutional support failed in their mission to preserve the materials, and scholars have hardly rushed to use the materials that did find their way to the archive. Even if the project had attained its lofty goals of preserving many diverse corpora of oral data, it's not clear that scholars in adjacent disciplines, many of whom had abandoned their own textual legacies would have been interested. Anthropologists were caught in the non-textual doctrines of structural functionalism, a school of thought in which the proper object of study in anthropology is how social institutions promote a stable social system synchronically. Structural functionalism saw little value in texts, notwithstanding, for example, uh, Edward, Evans Pritchard's occasional publication of Azande texts. Linguists were seeking to conduct surveys as quickly as possible for the purpose of classifying language historically or typologically, as illustrated in, for example, Greenberg's 1963 works on classification of African languages or on word order typology. So while, Afri while anthropologists and linguists who actively conducted research in East Africa at the time and who had close historical ties, for example, to Boaz's textualist project, 
might seem likely to have produced collections of texts in the languages that they studied. They didn't really. Only historians provide any indication of having assembled corpora of texts driven in part by their need to invent a new subfield in a history discipline that rejected African history as impossible. While this pressure led historians to take up methods that counteracted some of their stated goals for their archives, it also is sort of the thing that necessitated their collecting corporate to begin with. So earlier I discussed a lot of the ways that the methods that historians use to collect texts short-circuited their goals, but I do wanna come back to make the point that historians were the people out there collecting texts in the first place. So what I wanna do by way of kind of wrapping up is to talk a little bit about how John Weatherby's materials in particular ended up kind of falling off the face of the earth for a while. He spent a lot of his career stuck between these three disciplines, uh, history, anthropology, and linguistics. In over a decade of research, he produced a sizable corpus of notes documenting his encounters with so people, re recordings documenting so speech, and to a lesser extent, Nyang Yi. As the So and the other Kuliak speaking peoples have attracted scholars' interest by way of their divergence linguistically and culturally from their Nilotic neighbors, um, one might expect such a corpus to have been a valued data source. However, Weatherby's audio recordings and handwritten notes, which would strike me decades later as long sought resources, found no institutional home in disciplines such as history, linguistic, or in disciplines such as linguistics and anthropology, notwithstanding persistent efforts by Weatherby to preserve them. So they never fit, fit neatly into the ecology of any particular scholarly community. As a result, his work often languished in disciplinary interstices. What this often looked like is Weatherby and the academic structures that he interacted with moving at cross purposes. Um, one such in instance is attested in his efforts to contribute to linguistics himself, uh, which culminated in an incident that bruised his relationship with Berndt Heine and discouraged him from pursuing linguistic studies ever again. Um, obviously it was Weatherby discouraged from pursuing linguistic studies, not Heine. If things gone differently, it's possible that Weatherby's work would later have been a little bit more easily recognizable as including linguistically relevant data as at least he would have had at one published linguistic study. Um, but that's not what happened. Not yet having conducted his own field work with the Kuliak languages, Heine encouraged Weatherby to travel up to the Ik and the Nyang Yi, presumably to facilitate Weatherby's use of linguistic methods in reconstructing the history of So for his thesis. But the outcome of all of this is that Weatherby took on a new research project, devoted a lot of his time to traveling, to collecting data, to writing a paper that he felt was outside the scope of his research. And after several exchanges with the editor of the journal that he submitted it to, he received word that his paper had been rejected because Bernd Heine had submitted a paper covering much the same material, or in any case, Bernd Heine was planning to submit such a paper. Weatherby was understandably irritated. Um, he and Heine continued corresponding and things remained cordial. But Weatherby threw up his hands, he was finished with linguistics after that. He never pursued the dissemination of his research um, as being something that could be linguistically interesting again. The only mention of Weatherby's research as a potential source of linguistic data is uh, from one of Heine's later publications. And nearly 50 years later, the, the frustration in the Weatherby family with the lack of credit that John Weatherby had received for his early fieldwork in Kuliak languages was still evident in my earliest communication with his daughter, Joanna. Later on, he tried to find other ways to get his materials preserved. Uh, later in life, it seems like he 
was aware that the traditions that he had recorded, the interviews that he had recorded, all of his field notes would conceivably be of benefit for future generations. And during uh, one article that he wrote 10 years after he gave up on an academic career, uh, in correspondence with the editor of the journal, he said, quote, I have only one desire, and that is that the material which I gathered carefully over a long period of years should be available to those likely to be interested, since it will never again be possible to have access to the very old men and women who are still alive when I worked there. In 1996, at the age of 85 years old, um, he was still trying to arrange for his primary source materials to be deposited somewhere. Um, and so he contacted uh, an acquaintance at SOAS in London. And he said he had taken, quote, the last chance of working on the oldest age groups at the time. And he felt, quote, that all the remaining notes and diagrams besides the thesis itself are worth preserving for the future. But while Weatherby had some limited access at preserving analyzed products of his research through means like journal articles or Christopher Errett arranged for drafts of Weatherby's master's and PhD theses to be deposited at the UCLA library, nobody was willing to take on the original notes and audio recordings. The materials remained in Spain uh, where he retired until I began working with them in 2018. Uh, 15 years after Weatherby had passed away. And this work was only facilitated by Joanna's, uh, his daughter's persistence in working to get her father's thesis published posthumously and by a chance meal with a well-connected colleague at a conference, that's Bonnie Sands. Weatherby's research was a part of a doctoral thesis research project that did not work out. The project was conducted within a disciplinary project of archiving oral data for accessibility by scholars from a wide range of disciplines. That too did not work out. The History of Africa Archive at Makerere University, which may or may not have held copies of Weatherby's notes at some point, was also lost. His attempts to publish linguistic analyses came to naught in a really alienating fashion, barring off another avenue through which other scholars might have come to think of his work as including data of linguistic value. He did manage to publish some of his findings in a 1980s article in Africa, but the anthropologically oriented venue and subject matter didn't make his work visible as including a large textual database, uh, given the marginalization of texts in anthropology that I discussed earlier. His work could far too seldom find a disciplinary home, and the home that it found in Webster's A History of Africa project disappeared almost as soon as Weatherby became involved with it. Although the notes were produced in a disciplinary context for disciplinary purposes, what ultimately preserved them was not the disciplinary structures for archiving that existed and that were being actively pursued at the time. Instead, what preserved his notes and made them accessible to me 50 years later was the care of somebody with relational rather than disciplinary commitments, his daughter. So Weatherby produced a huge body of field notes and audio recordings within a broad project of 1960s Africanist historians to describe the past at greater time depth than could be accomplished using archived written records alone. Like many other researchers in this disciplinary project of Africanist history, whether we turn to the systematic collection of original language texts as sources of evidence about the past. In the texts that they collected, the historians saw corrupted accounts of the past that could, with proper data collection methods and historical source criticism, have the distortions of bygone generations purged from them, yielding a less mediated view of the past. They also imagined the texts as repositories of data that could interest scholars from other disciplines. Both of these perspectives on the value of texts motivated a vision for the establishment of new oral data archives. Conventions in the discipline of history have long demanded that historical analyses should be retraceable to the primary sources from which they were made, and scholars from other disciplines could only make use of the texts uh, that they could access. From the historically contingent processes of decolonization in African 
Democratization in the nascent universities of Anglophone Africa. A generation of historians produced bountiful oral history texts in audio and transcript forms that they hoped would be of use to other scholars as well. But there's a real palpable tension between the 1960s and 1970s Africanist historians' stated aim to produce records that could serve a wide range of disciplines and the disciplinary nature of their archiving practices. And I think a similar tension can be observed in language documentation. The apparatus that we've designed to house our ostensibly multi-purpose records, taken to be of great value for practitioners of any discipline, is explicitly language archives. And it strikes me as ironic that having wrestled with the, the obstacles that disciplinary boundaries have raised in locating and working with the Weatherby Collection, my response has been to deposit newly digitized and annotated versions of the items from the collection into a new disciplinarily bounded archive. So I find myself after working on archiving things and then thinking about disciplinary tensions in preserving primary source materials, will my project have been more successful in making Weatherby's field notes and audio recordings accessible to other scholars and stakeholders than the Africanist archiving activists of the 1960s were. And in asking this, I suggest that at least prior to my intervention, the preservation of Weatherby's field notes and recordings was a failure. And I've talked about it like it was throughout much of this talk. And in some ways, this is undeniably true. Conservators were unable to capture audio from one of Weatherby's audio tapes. Um, one track was lost from another tape. But in another sense, it's like kind of not true that Weatherby's materials were a preservational failure. Uh, half a century after he made the notes and recordings in question, I've accessed them and they remain useful to me. In this sense, something about the way that the notes were preserved surely succeeded. The success was facilitated by a web of relationships and I'm persistently impressed by the degree to which even physically accessing Weatherby's materials depended on a complex social landscape. The materials themselves have long been cared for by Joanna Weatherby, and it wouldn't have occurred to me that there was a possibility of locating the materials, except that about 10 years ago, she revised her father's doctoral thesis and got it published by the University of Salamanca Press. Joanna Weatherby was encouraged in this work by a colleague and friend of her father's, John Lamphere, whom she contacted for advice about whether the thesis could imaginably be of use for anybody about anything. And then my own attempts to locate the materials were fueled by my own relationship with Weatherby's consultant, Lokiru Kosma, which was framed in its earliest moments by his query as to whether I knew John Weatherby. My awareness of the materials and motivation to locate them might have come to nothing, except for Bonnie Sands' generosity and connections in helping me actually find the materials when at a chance meeting at an LSA conference, she asked if there were any materials I was trying to find. The most beautiful, strange question I think I've ever been asked. Um, decades after Weatherby conducted the field work, access to his work was mediated through personal and professional relationships that outlived him. Um, this is an idea that I don't find discussed very much in the language archive discourse. And I kind of just want to put it out there for um, some thought for me, for us here in thinking about archiving in the future. Uh, what are the consequences of the fact that major archiving projects often fail um, in terms of their stated structural goals, but what perhaps most reliably gets access to materials for mobilization is the relational underpinnings and the web of connections that humans have with the materials um, moving forward. So thank you very much. Um, the corpus is in progress at elrarchive.org slash DK0646. Uh, this has been funded by an NSF Dell grant, which I forgot to put the title of here, oops. Um, happy to take questions. I'd also love to hear what the view of interdisciplinary trends in text collection from further down the Rift Valley is.
And I'm happy for people to email me about any of these issues. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, Sam, for this really interesting presentation. I think it's given us a lot to reflect on. Uh, with that, we can begin the question and answer session. So the question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written ones. So if you would like to ask a question, just raise your hands using the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question that's also still possible, you can do so using the chat module. And as usual, I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are being recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Um, let me see if I see a first raised hand from Harold. So I'll ask him to unmute. Uh, hello. Um, did you say that whether we uh, actively tried to get SOAS to host his papers and tapes and so I said no and why didn't so say no do you know yeah so in the archive I've posted the correspondence that I have from this exchange uh, it took place in the mid 1990s and the context of this refusal is essentially that Weatherby emailed and said will you take my stuff and there's five or six boxes of completely uncatalogued jumbled up tapes and papers. And the archivist at SOAS at the time said, we need something to work with if you're going to give it to us. And yeah, that they said no. Something to work with. So they would need like an inventory list or stuff like this. What would... Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've got some evidence. There's slips of paper that are dated to like 1992. Um, of Weatherby maybe trying to do an inventory, but I can definitely testify that he never got a working inventory done because it's been a ton of work trying to figure out what, it's 25 hours of audio and 6,000 pages of field notes, and it's basically no metadata. I mean, the, there's this paper by the so as archivists that uh, from 1995 where they called archives and manuscripts collections relating to Africa where they say that they take in people's um, archives and want to make them available so it's it seems that uh, they're not really uh, <laughs> uh, playing the same outward game as the inward game but, yeah. Wow. Okay, thank you. I am By very David Anderson and and Rosemary yeah. Seton. I don't know what role they had in the in the correspondence if they were even involved in. If that's who it was, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm thank not you. completely surprised. I mean, some archives seem to be uh, not fantastic at doing what they're claiming that they want to do. But anyway. Yeah. Um, I see that there was uh, something in the chat before I move on to Bonnie, uh, which was from Thomas, who says, first of all, he thanks you for uh, the presentation. And then he asks, what contributions do we expect from working on endangered languages? I think that the question of what contributions we can expect from working on endangered languages have been um, really addressed in a pretty wide range of data. And I'm concerned that I'm not gonna give it very, uh, a very just report here. Um, my, my personal rather than uh, discipline standard take on this is that the most important contributions we can expect from working on endangered languages are building and sustaining lasting valuable relationships with people who have been uh, marginalized for a long time and helping them reach the goals that they have for themselves. And from a more linguistics centric position, um, I think it really just depends on what your approach is. I think any school of linguistics 
whatever they do, that thing is going to be dependent upon data, as rich of a database as possible. And studying endangered languages will give us access to that. I'm less sanguine about the idea of how I can personally benefit from working on endangered languages uh, in terms of like getting marketable knowledge, because I don't really think that that's exactly something that I have the right to. So I don't know how satisfying of an answer that is, but those are, those are my knee-jerk intuitions. Great, then um, I will ask Bonnie to unmute so she can ask her question. Hi, Sam, thanks for the shout out. But actually ha with Harold commenting, I should say that my interest in you accessing the materials is helped by a network too. Harold and uh, Yoni Maho and their bibliographic efforts tied with mine. You know, the fact that somebody at some point wrote whether be unpublished field notes, this was like, this is on my list of things to try to get, you know? So I don't think I would ever have been as persistent were it not for colleagues such as Harold who are equally persistent and enjoy digging through archives and finding these things as I do. But I, I really appreciated your talk because we as linguists often don't take that interest in the history of our discipline and how that affects what we do. And that's really important. And I'm seeing that still with a, historians who work with language data, that they seem to treat the language data as disembodied from people and as if it uh, is timeless. And that's very frustrating where I want to know who did you get this data from? When did you get it from? Uh, uh, Richard Bailey will know what I'm talking about. The, the, uh, an example of the Lala, <laughs> the group that is heavily influenced by Zulu in South Africa. And it's like, data from 100 years ago and data from like last week are treated the same and they're like oh yeah well our classification differed from others because our lala speakers are different it's like you don't even publish your data so that we can tell where it came from it's aggravating but uh you know i'm sure we all are aggravated at other linguists for not uh meta providing the metadata one would want so i guess i that don't was, have a question sorry that was lala yeah, but in, um, well, I can, uh, th this is a sort of a, a pre group that now more or less speaks Zulu. And uh, so, it, you know, when the, uh, <laughs> I would love anyway. a reference or something. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll send you the uh, thesis I'm talking about. Great. Thank where, you so much. Well, that's the, the problem is where language can be taken as, um, well, it's not the primary focus of interest for, say, historians or even for linguistic anthropologists. So that they're trying to use data to pr to make a larger claim, and then and the data itself is not is considered almost the least interesting part of it. So I don't Thank have you. a question. You should have given that part of talk. my talk. <laughs> that was lovely. And I think Andrew has a question. And thanks for this talk. Um, in a lot of ways, sort of a cautionary tale in, in, in some ways. And I was wondering, sort of in, in a rough and ready way, do you have any thoughts on, so for example, you know, I, lot, I, I know a lot of us here are collecting our stuff. Some of us are archiving it. Some of us are hoping for it to be archived. What do we do to avoid, um, to avoid a fate like, like Weatherby's data? What are there, what are things that we can do along the way or what are their sort of, are these personal practices? Are these institutional things? What, what's sort of your take on that? I am just dying about this. I have been in existential crisis with this project, trying to figure out like, what is the solution? Um, I mean, I ended up cutting a lot for time and some of the things that I cut were ways that I'm maybe cautiously optimistic that at least in terms of discoverability, a lot of the linguistics infrastructure right now is in a lot better position than some of the things I was talking about. Um, but I think moving past discoverability, we still have the major issue of handling the data in a way that as Bonnie was saying, 
acknowledges the situatedness of the data's origins. Um, and honestly, like, if I had to say in a nice neoliberal fashion, like the solution to this problem is for everybody to do the right thing in the market of stuff, I would maybe say prioritize writing more ethnographically alongside structural types of things. Get yourself citable with things that make the situated nature of the data essential. And I think another thing, like I see the Rift Valley network is pretty exemplary in some of this and that I think fostering like scholarly collaboration with the people who you're working with and having them like actually have a voice in scholarly outputs and not just in recordings is key to that. So um, those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. And Martin? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't have a, well, you got me thinking. Yes, I think you got everybody thinking. And I was a little bit um, taken aback by your, yeah, sort of um, frustration or, 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 or a negative tone that um, that I uh, that I hear uh, in this in the stories. I um, I'm, I'm very glad that you found the data and and, and that they're available. And I I think uh, I'm not very sad that the historians uh, uh, collected the data the way they did. They just did, and I'm very glad that. Uh, still some available that time also in Tanzania, most of them in Dar es Salaam available. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, the Martin Maus of today is very dissatisfied with the, the way he collected data uh, some, some years ago. And I, I see all sorts of uh, yeah, challenges uh, uh, with uh, if, 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 if you uh, want to do anything, with my data. Um, so uh, if, if I'm just out of a, a meeting with the ethics committee at Leiden University, so I have my eternal fight about anonymizing. So uh, I'm sure in 10 years from now, I could only get this in an archive if I would anonymize all my sources. And then the present Sam is not very happy with that. I don't know about the future Sam, but I mean, these, these discrepancies between what we think is the right way to do and, and what is necessary to how, to how to store things and what kind of data do we really want, that is going to be of all times. And I think in a way we are, as, as, as Andrew mentioned, we are, we are, or maybe in your reaction to Andrew, we are much better positioned now with the, with, from our chair on the worldwide web we, we 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 know that there is somebody will know that there was once this 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 weirdo mouse among the iraqo and he must have something there and my notes are they will give you as much as frustration as 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 whether these notes have given you because when i did my thesis research it was about the analysis the grammar and and these notes are really messy i can't do much with them myself. And, and uh, there are about 100 uh, exercise books, written notes, that I collected texts is more or less pure coincidence because the way I was, uh, I was trained that that was not really what you would do. So in, in those few years that I existed, those, uh, those traditions have already, uh, and those ideas have already changed dramatically. So, uh, all, although maybe I'm even more pessimistic than you are, I'm also more optimistic in the sense that, well, let's be happy with all we, we find. And yes, I fully agree with you that it's the social relations that uh, that, that make it happen and, and, and the pers preservation and the, the curiosity and, uh, and that we think, okay, there must be something there. I, I mean, there's so many things that I think there must be something there. Uh, 
also for the Rift Valley. And, and I, I, I agree, we in the Rift Valley, maybe we could, we could also try to do, to, we're doing in, 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 in not specific, in not explicit ways, but, but we are helping each other to find these things. But maybe we could even do a bit more explicitly. What are, what are the data collections that, that must, must exist and that are lost and who knows what? So those those were my random unstructured thoughts, but I found it very interesting and thought provoking. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the realisticness without pessimism in what you had to say there. Uh, I think that there's a perspective that comes from having done this work a lot of different ways and having different versions of yourself that have looked back on it um, that I think is really important for a lot of the current discourse about archiving and documentary linguistics. Um, because I think just as you had your optimism that we've got things and they're good. I've got Weatherby's stuff and it's good that I have it. It's a really amazing opportunity. Um, I also hear in your response a realism about what we can expect the data to do when we've deposited our primary recordings. And I, I think that there's a lot of struggle with being able to immediately abstract out a yes, no answer to whether an analysis is valid on the basis of an audio recording on a website, that I think that that, that question, um, I, I hear that in what you say also about your feelings about somebody else working with your own materials in the future. And I definitely feel that way about work that I've done from my own field work. So thank you, Martin. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Doris Bain. I don't know if you can hear me okay. Yes, I can. Okay, so I, reflecting on my own frustrations, I appreciate Martin's comment about his present and past selves. Um, I also wrestle with my past self. I'm currently in the process of trying to write some grammar materials on data that I have collected quite over quite some period of time on Maasai. And the comment about metadata, even in a very small, you might say super small network of people is really key. So my current self is finding that a certain kind of metadata that a past self and also that a former graduate student developed is so important for my ability to find things in the data. And it's painstakingly um, time consuming to have developed that database um, or that metadata. Some of the metadata is in a toolbox, actually it's all in toolbox, but in uh, different sorts of forms where it was just a matter of filling out a skeleton, like this particular example has this kind of aspect, it has this person, it has this number, it has this um, directional. And also that it was on this page of that notebook that we took the time to put all of that information into, I guess you could call it a spreadsheet, although it's a toolbox database. Um, I am now finding that I, I have the notebooks scan, um, photocopied in my bedroom because of current working conditions. But the fact that I have this sort of key of what to find where, at least, um, you know, it's not history kinds of things, it's linguistic kinds of information. It is very, very time consuming to develop that metadata. But now it's useful, at least to me, um, you know, 20 years later. I don't know if it would be useful to anyone else. Um, but this- I wish Weatherby had done that. 
the, this issue of sort of sitting on data, I'm also sitting on data that someone else collected who's now died, but from Peru. And I, I know the intricacies and the unusual way that that data was put together and that that data was transcribed and parsed. And I feel like I need a couple more lifetimes to make that somehow accessible and usable to anyone else given the knowledge that I've developed about how it was constructed and just represented and even where it is. Um, so I'm very frustrated by these kinds of things. I don't know what's gonna to happen to all of my photocopied notebooks. You know, I left a set of them in Nairobi and I'm sure they no longer exist. Um, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but I highly doubt that anybody could find them where they were left a number of years ago, but at least I have copies and or originals of that material with me in Oregon, but I don't know who in the world wants this stuff. Yeah. So that's just a commentary on that. Yeah, thank you. Your metadata scheme sounds just like absolute pure gold. Um, that seems like the dream in terms of trying to work with archival materials. Um, as far as the rest of the collection, yeah, I think that a thing that I'm really hearing that resonates with me is that when we think about how extremely difficult it is to work with somebody else's materials, when we think about how much effort it takes to straighten out their idiosyncrasies, particularly if they haven't put together a really rigorous metadata scheme that spells everything out. I think that there's some sort of caution that we should maybe take for that when thinking about archiving present day work. And I don't know what the caution is. Um, I don't have a prescription besides the things I said to Andrew, but in my own work, I just find that there's not gonna be a simple cut and dried solution that makes what I deposit in ELAR uh, universally accessible. And I guess the first step for me in solving the problem is admitting that there's a problem or something like that. But thank you. I really appreciated those thoughts. Martin? Thank you on this, on this, uh topic uh, that uh, that Doris raises like those those collections by other people and yeah where what to do with it um okay i uh, some somebody comes for me to me and and klaus pieper is is close to dying and he has these cassettes and and what is it the son in law uh uh, wants to get rid of them and um, so they they belong they 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 end up on my desk i'm never going to to work on it i i, I don't know anything in the, the language in the area um, this this particular example they got by 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 coincidence that there was a project they made and got at least digitized uh, but uh, i've i've uh, i think a lot of those dead bodies in my <laughs> in in my office and i'll soon won't have an office anymore and and then the space and and i know but so it's also harold's remark about so as that that makes me wonder i mean what what can we do i mean uh, the, it would be nice if there if there would be some 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 possibility where we where we could bring stuff that is accepted even without, even as just boxes. So I do think that um, at least a few years ago, Nick Tieberger um, with Delamon was basically soliciting old collections of data um, 
my dissertation advisor, Sigmund Freisinger, I know had a collection um, digitized and deposited there, which my impression is that consisted of him putting a box in the mail and then getting the box mailed back to him. Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, I also know that I was at Sigmund's uh, retirement party about a week and a half ago, and I don't even remember what, I think it was uh, Michael Thomas, a former PhD student, had worked with a language from Northeastern Nigeria, and Sigmund was like, oh, do you want my old recordings from that language? They're taking up space in my office, and I'll probably have to throw them away soon when I leave. I could mail them to you instead. So like, I know that he's even been involved with that program, but there's still stuff that didn't get done. So I don't know what the status of that is. I also know that Jorge Rosas Labrada um, and maybe some other people earlier this year was working on a, a project that paired, I think, grad students with senior faculty uh, to work together, to get funding to work together uh, to archive pre-existing um, materials from older and senior scholar from earlier in senior scholars' careers. So there seem to be some options in some places. Um, but Thank yeah, you. increasingly, I think there should be some sort of centralized, what are the options for getting my 30-year-old, 20-year-old recordings, notes, archived somewhere, yeah. I think Harold likes to jump in with it. Yeah, I can't, I can't speak for these archives. My impression is, I mean, there is a, there is a couple of places. So there's a Paradisec, there's SOAS, there is the AILA, and maybe some more. And it's true that they want you to give the metadata, but uh, I wonder what happens if you just say, these are the tapes from Klaus Pieper on, I don't know, what was, was it Tsuku or something? And then, say that that is the metadata and they will accept it. And in reality, there might be 10 other languages in there, but at least then they have committed to archiving it. But the person who needs to find it in the future has to do some more detective work. I mean, this is how it works in, uh, in all the old archives in SOAS, for example, that they, um, they have metadata, but uh, that metadata is pretty far from complete. Uh, I looked in, uh, I found some stuff that I really had to dig for only because I knew that I was might find it there, but it wasn't in the metadata. So, I mean, may, maybe one of some people of you have tried asking Paradise like or Elar or whatever, what happens if you submit something with a uh, vague metadata tag, which, and you say that that is the metadata. Yeah, I definitely know that when Sigmund got his stuff deposited with Paradisec, um, there was no there was no metadata of any kind, um, and that was a an odd aerial fit, of course, because Paradisec is not typically associated with African languages, and Sigmund's materials all were. But um, I can track down that Tiberger wrote a paper, basically about this initiative to get old archival things um, deposited, essentially. And I, I don't know what the status of that is anymore, though. I will just briefly read out the comments that Doris put in the chat. So she says a major question for her is where to deposit this data. And she adds that archives tends to be slash R um, early specific or R project funding specific. Yeah. Um, uh, Bonnie, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I, well, it's definitely a problem for Africa that we don't have an Africa-specific archive. Uh, my comment was that in my first uh, field work, some of my first field work, I was taking old uh, lexical document and trying to replicate it. So that was a lot, it took a lot more time than just asking for words from the start, but it was an interesting, training exercise in that I learned the ways that things can be mistranslated, misglossed so um, and mistranscribed. So it, I think in the end, it was a worthwhile thing to do. I was basically trying to make sure everything from the old, old records that I knew what it actually meant and that, you know, kind of in a way, uh, 
keeping that data alive in a sense. It was very hard. <laughs> I believe that. We had things like the, the word tomato was glass, or it was iname pay, which in actually just means something or other. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah in a, in a way i kind of wish everyone would do that because uh, you know yeah because uh glasses are are so we're so used to decontextualized language and uh, most language consultants are not used to that style of language yeah i don't remember what talk i was at when i heard this come up but some talk i was at this winter or spring uh, the point was raised that we often conceptualize archiving our materials as like end of life for our research. You do your big project, you deposit your stuff in an archive and like, that's it, it's dead. And I love the image that you just painted of keeping alive these archival materials, keeping alive people's older work. Um, because I think that I think that the data should still live. I think that the work that people have done should still live and that reconstructing the situation of the data's collection should still live. So thank you. Great, thank you. I think those are all the questions and comments for today. Let me just briefly check the chats. Um, but I think we're about done, yeah. So I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 2nd of June, and will be presented by Catherine Grillo. Uh, with that, I would like to thank Sam again for his presentation, of course, everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar.